So I want to start by thanking Boaz and Time. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in such a lovely building, and we get to see the sun, which I feel like is very uncommon for those conferences where we all are a little bit wilting like plants by the end of the day. So this is an absolute delight to be here. Um, as Kai mentioned, my primary research is actually on masculinity. Sorry, shall I meet? <laughs> um, I, 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 although today I'm going to be talking about women, so this is not part of my primary project, but um, I took it as a chance to think about uh, Gretz and larger issues of how we see women um, written into history or not, um, as the case may be. So, 19th century historians make easy targets for feminist critique. They write great man histories that relegate women to passive supporting roles or leave them out altogether. Heinrich wow. Gretz is no exception in this regard. First, women as a class are largely absent from his multi-volume history of the Jewish people. The vast majority of individual pages have no mention of any women at all. In its English translation, volume one has 61 instances of the word she, and 20 of these refer to Israel, Jerusalem, or Judea, and not human women at all, um, and more than a thousand instances of the word he. I use the English version because, of course, in the original German, other nouns are gendered, and so that would have been a problem. Um, second, when Gretz does mention women, it is most often as an undifferentiated class of people. Very few individual women are named. Instead, they appear, appear as the women, or perhaps the wife of a man. Third, women play background roles in the larger plot of Jewish history. If we remove their presence entirely, Gretz's narrative would have almost exactly the same series of causes, effects, trends, and major figures. It is a history where men write, direct, and play all the major roles. We, as 21st century scholars, could easily dwell on how Gretz's history misses out on so many important aspects and themes of Jewish history because he overlooks Jewish women. It can tell us very little about Jewish life in the home, for instance, and it can offer only an incomplete account of many other areas, like economics and religion, where women shaped Jewish, Jewish life even when they did not have many leadership roles. Gretz's history of the Jewish people misses out on half of the Jewish people, and in doing so, it also misses out on these important themes and movements of Jewish life. Okay, while this is an important critique, it's a bit like shooting fish in a barrel. Today, we mostly know better than to overlook the history of women when we want to write the history of a people. Here, instead of rehearsing this critique of Gretz's neglect of women, I look at how women do appear in the history of the Jewish people. Series. If they aren't leaders or thinkers, fighters or philosophers, what do they do? The four things women do most frequently in Gretz's history are one, die, two, suffer bodily injury, three, become captured or change hands as spoils of war, or four, serve as sexual objects for men. To generalize, in this story, women suffer. So why do women serve this narrative function of suffering? Was Gretz a misogynist and a sadist? Hardly. One relatively superficial reason is that women's role as sufferers follows from Gretz's narrative focus. His works are primarily military and political history. In realms of pre-20th century military conflicts and politics, women seldom played significant leadership roles. Women were not often generals, nor organized combatants, but they did suffer at the hands of opposition groups and during war times. When a historian is telling the story of wars and political movements, it can be easy to see only men as the main actors and women in vulnerable supporting roles. But the narrative function of women here is more than just a byproduct of the focus on military and political history. It also comes from the themes that Gretz saw as essential to Jewish history and life. His historical narrative implies that there's always an element within Jewry that is subject to suffering. I am, of course, not the first to observe Gretz's tendency toward the lachrymose, but attention to the centrality of suffering allows us to see the role of gender in his narrative. The representational logic works roughly in this way. Jewish women are trans-historically the objects of violence and suffering, Women are also an essential part of the Jewish people, 
when women, as representatives of the Jewish people, suffer, then women, disempowerment, and suffering become identified with one another and central to Jewish history. The gendered element of suffering becomes itself an essential component of the Jewish people and intimately tied to Gretz's conception of the essence of Judaism. To support this here, I'll articulate how women appear within the narrative as sufferers and as passive objects of others' action. Then, using some gender theory, we'll get to revisit Joan Scott. I'll discuss how women appear in another sense, as symbols of power relationships. I'll finally show how, despite their relative absence from Gretz's history, women nevertheless play a central role in demonstrating the essence of Judaism. Both grammatically and as characters of the story, women are most often objects rather than subjects. At one point, some women sell their jewelry to support the temple. At another, some chase after false gods. The biblical Deborah shows up. But these kinds of actions are rare. Women are not the protagonists of the story, and their presence does not move the plot forward. They rarely act, occasionally react, and most often appear only as the bodies that are acted upon by men. In fact, they are often the objects of violence. Sometimes they're sold into slavery. Sometimes they burn at the stake. And sometimes they're taken captive by non-Jews for sexual purposes. But in every era and in every volume of Gretz's history, women's primary narrative function is to suffer. Volume four, this is in the English translation, provides us with some typical examples. The first mention of Jewish women, which is 47 pages into the narrative, is the tale of French officials dragging women and children to prison and forcing them out of the land. The next reference reads, in several places, Jews were arrested, unmercifully tortured, and some of them burnt. In Chinon, a deep pit was dug, a fire kindled in it, and eight Jewish women and men thrown into it, who sang whilst dying. The mothers had previously cast in their children to save them from forcible baptism. Altogether, 5,000 are said to have suffered death by fire in that year. 46 pages later, the next time women appear, they suffer a similar fate. In a certain town of southern France on one day in the middle of May, the whole congregation of men, women, and children, together with their holy writings, were cast into the flames. The next time women appear, they are also put to the sword. We are on page 120, and all the Jewish women have done is die at the hands of those persecuting the Jews. It's worth noting that non-Jewish women seldom suffer the same fate. During these same 120 pages, three noble women and one sister of the Pope, each of whom is referred to by name, manage to create rules that persecute Jews. Only one of them dies. In other historical periods, Gretz's narrative is similar. Across the volumes, according to my unscientific count, Jewish women are killed 21 times, taken captive 27 times, and fight back precisely once. Women serve as objects of men's sexuality 17 times, doing such things as dancing at royal men's command, or by being distractions merely by virtue of their being women and in men's presence. Counting, of course, is a blunt <coughs> instrument. And numbers can't always tell us about the relative importance of characters or themes in a historical narrative. But other measures, who are the main characters, whose actions or thoughts drive history forward, whose lives are taken as emblematic, whose everyday actions are deemed important enough to narrate at all, all suggest similar things. The evidence is overwhelming. In Gretz's history, women are marginal, and their only recurring role is the one of suffering. Suffering women form a central element of the narrative in another sense besides just the numbers. The word women appears most often as part of a collective women and children, men, women, and children, or men and women. And in each of these cases, women is a faceless but yet essential part of the collective of Jewish identity. The representation of women as the women, or a component part of men, women, and children, rather than differentiated or historicized persons, say with names, um, makes women into a generic type. As a result, their suffering too leaves this impression of eternal recurrence rather than particular lives or individual events to be mourned. 
The recurring suffering of women creates a narrative in which women's suffering becomes transhistorical. In this way, women play an essential role in the story of the Jewish past. In fact, we might say that they all seem to play one role, the single role of women. We could name a couple of individual exceptions, so maybe all is an exaggeration, but close. They are an integral part of the Jewish people, and as part of this collective, in fact, the presence of the word women often signals times when Gretz means the entire community. When he writes the Jews, sometimes it just means Jewish men. For instance, he writes, chastity and holding the marriage vows sacred from the first had been characteristics of the Jews, and by Talmudic law, they had become even more deeply rooted in their natures. They could not endure the thought of their wives and maidens exposed to violation and the purity of their families, which they treasured as the apple of their eye, threatened with defilement. So here, if we pay close attention, Gretz claims that the Jews were faithful in marriage and would fight for the sexual safety of their wives and maidens. So here he uses the Jews to refer to men. Whereas, in distinction to this, other places he writes of men, women, and children, or even the women, this is a reference to the whole community. Okay, so thus far I've talked mainly about women, but there's also a larger point here to be made about gender. And here, when I'm talking about gender, I'm not talking about just women, but also men and the way that sexual difference is configured in these historical narratives. I think we could tell a really interesting story of men's gendered roles in these narratives, what they're doing, and I'll hint at this at the end. Um, thinking about gender also goes beyond chronicling the traits of men and women. At a deeper level, I'm also mindful of Joan Scott's classic formulation, where she defines gender as, quote, a primary way of signifying relationships of power. That is, Gender can be about more than just sexed bodies or even the social roles of men and women. When the Nazis disseminated feminized characters of the Jews, for instance, it was not because they actually thought that Jews had female genitalia or the same bodies as women. It was because they wanted to disempower and discredit Jews. This kind of propaganda, hardly limited to the Nazis, could be effective because many Western cultures associate women and femininity with lack of military, political, and physical power. Gretz's choices about how and where to include women structure a theme of Jewish disempowerment, a thread woven from the beginning to the end of the narrative. When a foreign army takes unnamed women captive, for instance, Gretz conveys a historical fact, but more importantly, he makes a statement about Jews' powerlessness in the face of their enemies. Once we're attentive to how gender signifies power relations, we can see how women's narrative presence isn't always there only to tell us facts about historical women. Women is also used as a symbol, and the narrative presence of this symbol, women, often emphasizes how Jews, as a community, do not have the space to exercise much military or political power. And remember, these are his main concerns. Gretz's narrative, Gretz's narrative uses women, then, as a way of signifying power relationships between the Jewish community and non-Jews in this history. For Gretz, community was more than simply one aspect of Jewish history to be described. It was, in some sense, the essence of that history. He, like other Wissenschaft historians indebted to German idealism, thought that history showed or demonstrated essences and ideas. These historians thought that writing Jewish history would make plain the essence of Judaism. Gretz's vision of this essence was distinctive. His history was not a story of religious progress. Right? Rather, in every era, Judaism's unchanging essence would manifest itself. Moreover, he did not think that the essence of Judaism was monotheism like it was for many of his reform adversaries. He, of course, thought it was monotheistic, but not that that was the essence. Judaism's kernel was not transcendence or even a transcendent God. It was a community, or perhaps another way of putting it would be God's imminent presence in community rather than transcendence or an abstract idea of monotheism. 
an accurate telling of Jewish history, and of course he imagined that his was this history, would reveal that Judaism was the center of Jewish history and that God's eminence in community was the essence of Judaism. If, as I've suggested, the narrative presence of women often signals the whole of the Jewish community, then women symbolizes this essence of Judaism and Jewish history. So women symbolizes something central in that its narrative presence evokes community. But what about women's suffering? How does that fit in? In 1855, the Jewish historian and reform rabbi Leopold Zunz wrote, if there are ranks in suffering, Israel takes precedence. If the duration of sorrows and the patience with which they are born ennoble, the Jews are among the aristocracy of the land. If a literature is called rich, which contains a few classic tragedies, what shall we say to a national tragedy list lasting 1,500 years, in which the poets and actors are also the heroes? Gretz admired Zunz. The two were acquaintances, and Gretz dedicated part of his history, the later part, to Zunz's life and scholarly activities. It's well known that some of these 19th century scholars espoused what Salo Baron has called the lachrymose conception of Jewish history. They told Jewish history as a tale of serial woe, endured by a patient and resigned people with little political or military power. Wissenschaft historians created a sense of the importance of martyrdom in Jewish history, especially, for instance, during the Crusades. For many of these writers, suffering was central not only to the narrative of the past, but also to the philosophical and religious mission of the Jews. Unlike some Christians who thought that God brought Jewish suffering in order to show others the errors of their theological ways, these Jewish writers thought that suffering demonstrated Jewish virtue and righteousness. Gretz shared both these tendencies, the narrative and the philosophical. To study and to wander, to think and endure, to learn and to suffer, these are the hallmarks for this long era, he wrote in the opening to one of these volumes. Lacrimose, yes. But we can say more than that. When we begin to pay attention to the role of gender in this lacrimose history, we see some of the contours of the sadness. These pairs that he gives us, study and wander, think and endure, learn and suffer. Each begins with a verb traditionally associated with Jewish men. Historically, men had been the ones to study, to think, and to learn. Even with the rise of reform, for instance, women still did not participate in traditional study very often. The second term of each pair, wandering, enduring, suffering, could all be communal or individual. And the wanderers, endurers, and sufferers could be men or women. A reader might be inclined to be dismissive and say Gretz was writing a history about men and was effectively deaf to the historical echoes of women, and so all of these six paired verbs are really about men. But as we've seen, I'm going to suggest otherwise, his narrative does mention women, and particularly as sufferers. If women participate in Gretz's hallmarks of the era, then it is by wandering, enduring, and suffering. Unlike his reform counterparts, Gretz did not suggest that all the historical suffering constituted evidence of the need for emancipation or as persecution that served as an explanation of why Jews of the day had social and physical flaws. So those are two other explanations that you'll see floating around in his contemporaries. But rather, as Ismar Shorsh has claimed, Gretz intended the depictions of suffering, quote, to intensify the attachment to Judaism whose institutions and beliefs had been sanctified by the blood of countless martyrs. Suffering, in this view, was integral to Jewish history because it demonstrated the value of Judaism and strengthened it. Unexpectedly then, despite their relative narrative passivity and facelessness, women participate in the essence of Judaism in two ways. First, historical women appear in the narrative and suffer. And second, women, appears as a symbol of the communal. These two modes of women, the historical characters and the symbolic that I've been expressing with my air quotes, are related. Suffering is integral to the Jewish community and suffering for the community in which God is imminent sanctifies Judaism. Thank you.